Welcome everyone. This is the final plenary and the concluding talk of this conference. It is my privilege today to introduce our speaker, Interjit Dillon. Uh, Interjit is the Gottesman family centennial professor of computer science and mathematics at UT Austin, where he's also the director of the Center for Big Data Analytics. Uh, currently he's at leave from uh, UT Austin and heads the Amazon Research Lab in um, uh, Berkeley, California, uh, where he's developing and deploying state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms and methods for Amazon search. Many of us know Inderjit from his groundbreaking work on the eigenvalue holy grail algorithm and linear algebra in general, but his pioneering contributions extend to big data, deep learning, machine learning, uh, network analysis and optimization. He received his Bachelor of Technology degree from uh, IIT in Bombay and his PhD from UC Berkeley. Interjit has received several awards, including the ICES Distinguished Research Award, the Siam Outstanding Paper Prize, the Moncrief Grand Challenge Award, the Siam Linear Algebra Prize, the University Research Excellence Award, and the NSF Career Award. He has published over 200 journal and conference papers and has served on the editorial boards of the Journal of Machine Learning Research, the IEEE Transactions of Pattern Analysis in Machine Intelligence, Foundations and Trends in Machine Learning, and the SIAM Journal of Matrix Analysis and Applications. Interjit is an ACM Fellow, is an IEEE Fellow, a SIAM Fellow, and a Fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science. Interjit, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it would have been great to meet old friends uh, in person, but at least, uh, you know, this is the last talk uh, of the conference. At least I'm not standing between you and your flight home. So we should be thankful for that. Uh, so today I'll talk about uh, machine learning and how linear algebra actually plays a very important role in developing scalable methods for machine learning. And, uh, you know, it's not just the scale of the data and the volume of the data that's important, but also in some applications, uh, like Andreas mentioned, I've been at Amazon search for the last few years, some applications which demand <coughs> real time uh, inference, linear algebra ends up playing a critical role in having a method that uh, you can put in front of uh, uh, real customers. So, uh, you know, my, here is the outline of my talk. Uh, this is about uh, multiple outputs, uh, predictions. First, I'll introduce the problem, talk about the challenges, and then I will introduce the method, uh, uh, methodology that we have developed. The methodology, you know, is, uh, uh, this is a machine learning framework that we call PECOS, stands for prediction for enormous and correlated output spaces. So we have a huge output space. One of the things that we can do is do an organization, a multi-scale organization by doing some uh, hierarchical clustering, you know, here in SVD methods are quite important. Then to do kind of uh, proper routing, uh, we need machine learning training. And it turns out that sparsity is very critical for this phase. And then finally, for being able to do real-time inference, it turns out that uh, you know it's a special kind of inference in this uh, scenario. And uh, you have to develop the appropriate data structures and the inference method for doing very efficient sparse matrix times sparse matrix multiplications. And finally, I'll conclude with this application of uh, semantic search that I'll keep on carrying throughout the talk. Okay, so when I teach a uh, uh, first course uh, in machine learning, typically we have a single output, uh, uh, either in the regression setting or in the classification setting, for example, trying to predict whether an email is spam or not. And, uh, you know, the setting is uh, in the regression setting, we have a real valued response uh, Y. Uh, we have some training data, which we denote by XI, and we collect that in this matrix X. And then we want to try and figure out uh, a prediction. Uh, 
And if we think about uh, the model being a linear model, then we are doing uh, essentially doing X times W is nearly equal to Y. Now, I know this is a linear algebra audience. So, you know, in my, this is a latex slide. So I do have macros that uh, can convert this capital X to capital A, this little W to little X and uh, little Y to B, little B. So it becomes the more familiar AX uh, nearly equal to B setting that we talk about in linear algebra, the notation we use, but I deliberately actually chose to keep this because the training data is actually like a sampling from some underlying uh, distribution. And we don't actually know the true uh, uh, X in some sense, the true training data. Um, so if we now think about something, you know, uh, uh, simple like linear uh, least squares, we know that we can get a closed form solution. And this is the well-known um, normal equations. And then in the classification setting, we have to separate one class from the other. And again, if you think about trying to get a linear decision boundary, we now have a categorical response uh, output vector Y. And then we need to separate, you know, the blue X's crosses from, sorry, the red crosses from the blue dots. And uh, in a high dimensional space, this corresponds to finding a hyperplane that separates the two classes. So many of these problems can be formulated in a, you know, what is called an empirical risk minimization framework in machine learning. So you have like a data fidelity term, and then you have a regularization term. And the regularization term is quite important because you want to try and prevent overfitting uh, uh, onto your, uh, to your training data. So ridge regression has, uh, uh, you know, L2 norm squared uh, regularization. If you want to try and promote sparsity in your coefficients, then there is this well-known Lasso framework. So these ridge regression and Lasso are very popular for regression problems. And then for classification, you have the linear support vector machine uh, uh, methodology, which tries to get uh, a separating a maximum margin, separating hyperplane between the classes. You can actually, uh, uh, it turns out that you can think of that as a loss function, which is called the hinge loss, right? It's actually non-differentiable uh, loss function. And then of course you have some regularization and also equally probably uh, popular uh, works well is this method of logistic regression where you have log loss plus uh, regularization. So if now you pick up a machine learning textbook, for example, this is by the well-known book by the Stanford statisticians, Hasty, Tipsharani, and Friedman, you can see that a substantial part of the book is devoted to linear methods, linear methods for regression, linear methods for classification. This book, I think, came out in about the early 2000s, and there's a book also by Chris Bishop on machine learning that came out around the same time. And uh, it also has an entire chapter, linear methods for regression, chapter three, chapter four, linear methods for classification. What I'll talk about today is uh, multi-output prediction. So let me first motivate where some of these problems might come from. So here is a problem, which is uh, uh, informally the Wikipedia tag recommendation problem. So here is uh, a Wikipedia page. Uh, this page happens to be on machine learning. And down below uh, are some tags or categories that have been associated with this particular page. So you might not be able to read this, but so I've reproduced them on the left. The tags that have been associated are learning and computer vision, machine learning, learning, cybernetics. And now if you think about each of these tags as an output by itself, you can see that there will be many, many outputs, right? In the millions easily. And um, uh, you can actually even see from this particular example that real data is going to be incomplete. You can think about many other tags you could have given this particular Wikipedia page and noisy. I mentioned the example of uh, Amazon search. So in product search, you can also think of this as a multi output uh, problem. So uh, the customers give a query 
And in response, you would like to see a ranked list of products, right? So you can think about each product actually as an output, as a possible output. And now you can see that the number of possible outputs is easily in the you know, uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions. So now if I go back to these uh, machine learning textbooks, uh, which we teach to our entering uh, uh, graduate students, they don't talk too much about multiple outputs. So there's a small little section over here in, I think it's only about a couple of pages in uh, um, the Hasty, Tipsharani and Friedman book on multiple outputs and nothing in the classification part. And similarly in uh, Bishop's book, a uh, small section on multiple outputs. So um, now uh, using the same kind of notation that we had before, I have, uh, uh, you know, my, response variables or my outputs are now not just a single column vector, but there are M of them, right? And this picture is a little misleading because I'm thinking of the case where M is in the millions, even hundred millions, even possibly billions. Similarly, we have training data and you can now, again, if you are trying to do regression, you can think about trying to have a linear model and if you treat each output independently, you know, this uh, objective function now changes. It's still the sum of squares. It's, no, it's now the Frobenius norm square. And here I presented the uh, closed form solution in terms of the singular value decomposition of uh, the training data uh, matrix X. And the reason I've, I've done that is <clears throat> because you could go back to this problem and say, hey, instead of teach treating each output independently, there are some correlations. I can actually put like a low rank, uh, I can make W or force W to be low rank. And in that case, what uh, happens is that, you know, you essentially get uh, the same kind of closed rank solution. It's just now the rank K SVD of this through the wonderful properties of the singular value decomposition. So here's a closed form solution in the case of regression problems. But of course, uh, in uh, classification, the uh, situation is not that easy. And, uh, you know, again, like a naive way of, if you try to assume that all the outputs are independent, you will get an independent binary classifier for each output or each label. So let's just do a thought experiment. Let's just do like a back of the envelope calculation. Uh, what if we use this naive approach of using a separate classifier for each uh, output? So let's look at this Wikipedia data set. You know, in some sense, it's a toy Wikipedia data set with half a million labels. Uh, let's assume that we have 1.5 million um, Wikipedia pages in the training set. Um, and uh, if we look at the collection of all the words and we use like a TF-IDF vectorization, the vocabulary size can be quite large. This is the collection of all the words in these 1.5 million documents. Um, so in this case, it ends up being 2.5 million. Of course, each Wikipedia page is quite sparse. So each Wikipedia page is represented by a sparse vector in 2.5 million dimensions, but uh, with only 1,000 uh, non-zeros. Now, suppose we want to try and have L binary one versus rest classifier. So in this case, half a million binary one versus rest classifiers, right? And each of the classifier, is going to be, uh, you know, if we are looking at, let, let's say, just a linear model like logistic regression or SVMs, is going to be captured by a, a vector of size uh, 2.5 million. So you can use, uh, there are highly efficient uh, software libraries available for this. One is uh, called LibLinear, and a reasonable estimate using state of the art methods is about 50 seconds for each uh, classifier. So if you, if you, if you look at this, uh, 50 seconds for each classifier, the overall training time for getting this model would still be in excess of two years on one CPU. And now if you do, you know, if you use a multi-way, uh, multi-core machine and assume perfect 16-way parallelization, it'll still take a little under two months to, uh, you know, just get this model. And, uh, but, it's not just training time, but also model size that becomes very prohibitive, right? So if I look at the model size in single precision for this naive approach, you would require five terabytes of disk usage. So for those of you who would like to attempt to do deep learning, uh, you know, one of the simple ways of doing this would be a softmax 
what's called a softmax layer on top of these capital L labels. The memory footprint would still be five terabytes and the overall training time would actually be much, much more because you have to do back propagation and all the parameter parameters need to be uh, trained together. So, you know, the point of this slide is that naive approaches are just prohibitively expensive in this case. So let's now talk about uh, the methodology that we have uh, developed. So we've developed this framework called PECOS, uh, Prediction for Enormous and Correlated Output Spaces. Let me motivate it by some of the problems at uh, Amazon. <clears throat> so I've already mentioned uh, product search where, you know, uh, in response to a query, you want to get a ranked uh, uh, list of products. You might actually want <clears throat> the opposite. Uh, which is that given a particular product, and let's say it's title, you would want to predict the queries that may be used to purchase this product, right? So this might be good for uh, presenting in to, in, uh, to the sellers. And then uh, you also may want to do related searches. So here the inputs are um, queries and the outputs are queries. Here the inputs are products, the outputs are queries, and here the inputs are queries and the output space is the space of all products. So all these methods, and there are many other uh, cases, like I mentioned in the Wikipedia example, the common task is given a text input, I want to try and provide predictions from these enormous output spaces. And what saves us is that even though the output space is enormous, there's a tremendous amount of correlation between the items in this output space. So before I go into detail in uh, uh, you know, the method that we've developed, one of the things that you know, I'm uh, quite happy about is that uh, we've actually been able to open source uh, the PECOS uh, software. You know, I know that in the past when I was uh, uh, working on LAPAC, you know, LAPAC obviously has made a huge contribution to um, linear algebra software and it's open source. So just kind of trying to uh, do our little bit in giving back to the research community. But uh, I'll describe the method now. And then, you know, if you're interested, you can uh, play around with this software. Okay, so let's uh, think back to the challenges that we have, right? We have millions, possibly billions of outputs. Now, one thing I did not really mention is that, uh, um, most of these values are actually missing in the response matrix or the training data matrix Y, because uh, many times this represents the interaction between an input and an output. And so many of the values are actually uh, missing. So typically this matrix Y will be, you know, less than uh, uh, or more than 99% sparse. And then the other part is that uh, other challenge is that many of these non-zeros only correspond to positive interactions, right? So, and not necessarily about negative interactions. For example, in the Wikipedia article, you don't necess necessarily have the, the training data, which is which tag is not relevant to a particular Wikipedia page, right? So sometimes this is called as the positive unlabeled learning problem. And like I said, core, there are substantial correlations between outputs when you have so many outputs and many examples like product search need uh, real-time inference. So here again, I've just kind of mentioned the uh, challenges. Let me highlight this part, which is the fact that, you know, in this uh, training data, if for example, look at this matrix Y, what ends up happening is that natural data sets have you know, some sort of power law kind of distribution. And what that means is that there are many, many, many columns over here, which we call as tail outputs that have only a handful of non-zeros, maybe even just one, maybe even zero. And so there's a paucity of training data for these tail outputs. And like I said, you know, only positive training examples are available. So if you think about the classification example, typically you have positive and negative labels. So you need to try and infer uh, negatives. And so what PECOS does is uh, it uh, has computationally efficient schemes for training and inference. Um, 
that's how it deals with this uh, enormous output space and the need to do real-time inference. Uh, there's a long, so it exploits some correlations to transfer training data from head to tail output so that the, the uh, results are a little bit more robust. And then it efficiently tries to infer negatives, right? That are hard to distinguish from the positives. And so we call them strong negatives. So let me now get down to the details. So one of the first things we want to do is somehow organize this enormous uh, output space and build kind of like an index on top of it. Okay. One way, and this number of outputs can be in the billions. So if you look closely at the training data and the kinds of data sets that we have, so many of them, uh, you know, lots and lots of rows, lots and lots of columns, and small number of non-zeros. So now you can think of this as a bipartite graph. And one way to try and organize it is by trying to do graph partitioning in this massive graph. And then you can do it recursively. So one of the techniques that we can use is uh, use actually the singular value decomposition or singular vectors to construct uh, kind of cuts in this, uh, in this graph. So um, you don't want to just use kind of minimum cuts over here because what can happen is if you just use a minimum cut, you can uh, um, uh, get out very small uh, uh, partitions. You know, one of the partitions will be very small, one will be very large. So in graph partitioning, sometimes you say, hey, maybe I will get cut so that the partition sizes are equal but that doesn't really make sense in uh, kind of these kinds of data sets, right? Where the partitions may somehow, you know, be uh, uh, related to the data. So one way of uh, getting around uh, this is to have a weighted graph cut objective. So here is, you know, for trying to do two partitions, you have cut normalized by the weight. So what you can show is that um, if I now look at the, corresponding graph Laplacian for the bipartite graph, right? Then I can think about an appropriate discrete vector. This discrete vector has uh, entries related to the weights. Then there's a, you can show that this quantity on the right over here, this normalized weighted graph cut is actually exactly equal to a Rayleigh quotient. Right, which is Q transpose LQ divided by Q transpose WQ. And here, so you can, and then it turns out that, you know, since these uh, are discrete vectors, um, this discrete vector um, has uh, certain entries and those actually satisfy an ortho, uh, uh, orthogonality constraint. And what then you can show is that this problem, if I now relax this discrete constraint is like the Fiedler vector. It is solved when Q is the eigenvector corresponding to the second smallest eigenvalue of the generalized eigenvalue problem. So generally in the Fiedler case or in most many spectral clustering cases, there is nothing on the right-hand side, but if we are trying to do weighted graph cuts, then we have this diagonal weight matrix. Okay. And so you can look at the, the uh, adjacency matrix or the graph Laplacian of the bipartite graph, and it has this particular form. And it's again, probably very familiar to people who work with you know, eigenvalue problems and singular uh, 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 and SVD problems. And it's not a surprise that if you do some simplification, what turns out is that these uh, uh, partition vectors for the left side of the bipartite graph and for the right side of the bipartite graph end up being the singular vectors of uh, the left singular vectors of A and then the right singular vectors for the right side of the partition. So now this is just for bipartitioning. If you now want to try and uh, um, divide a cluster into get more partitions, then you can actually use more uh, singular vectors. But now, if you think about it, you have a huge graph. And if you want to try and construct more and more singular vectors, that itself can become quite expensive. So fortunately, it turns out that you can actually do spectral clustering without eigenvectors. Okay, what do I mean? 
Suppose you are still trying to optimize these weighted graph cut objectives. What turns out to be the case is that you can show that this weighted graph cut objective is actually mathematically equivalent. Okay, sorry, there's a typo out here. It's mathematically equivalent to something called weighted kernel k-means. Okay. Um, and the way you can show it is that you can basically say that both objectives can be formulated as trace maximization. Now, I don't expect you to know what weighted kernel k-means is, except that you, you should realize, you should know that it is a method where you can uh, take an input partitioning and monotonically reduce the objective. So I can take an input partitioning with a particular weighted graph cut value, and I can iteratively refine this partitioning so that I get partitions which have progressively lower weighted graph cuts. Now, but this algorithm is, uh, you know, is uh, subject to uh, the typical k-means kind of algorithm is subject to local minima and has all sorts of other problems. So if you just ran it on the entire graph, it actually will not work well. So what we did is we took inspiration from uh, this work by Karipis and Kumar on this meta software by solving the problem at multiple, at multiple scales, right? So what we do is we will take the input graph, we will repeatedly coarsen it using a very simple coarsening strategy. Suppose just, you know, merging uh, adjacent, merging edges, for example. So you get a large, you have a large graph, you get a graph with about half the number of vertices, smaller, smaller, smaller. And then at some point of time, it's small enough that you can do a clustering or a partitioning on this graph. And then that's where this equivalence comes in. Once you have a partitioning of this, then you lift the partitioning up to the uncoarsened graph, and then you run weighted kernel k-means and refine the partitions. You, you up uncoarsen, run weighted kernel k-means, you uncoarsen, you run weighted kernel k-means, you uncoarsen, you run weighted kernel k-means, and finally you get a partitioning of the entire graph. And one of the reasons it works well is because you are actually solving the problem at multiple scales. And it turns out that, you know, if you go again inside to look at this weighted kernel k-means uh, uh, example, then, um, uh, you can actually, I think in some case, I think we showed that if the um, vertex weights are integer, you don't actually even need any floating point computation for doing this. And we actually have software, uh, you know, on my UT web page that, uh, that uh, does this and is very fast. So let's go back to the product search uh, example. So by kind of, uh, so here, you know, is a collection for you. So again, it's a it's a small kind of cartoon, small example. Suppose you have iPads and you have uh, digital cameras. You have some featureization uh, or some way of doing partitioning of these. So you do a first level clustering that separates the iPads and tablets from the cameras. And then you get a more refined clustering where your now iPads are separated from the surface. Microsoft Surface and uh, the DSLRs are separated from the other digital cameras. And now you arrange all your, whoops. Sorry. You arrange all your uh, uh, outputs in this hierarchical tree. So that's what I mean by multi scale organization of the output space. And we call this semantic indexing. And now how will now uh, the relevant outputs be found? So given an input, right? Suppose I have a query which says iPad. Well, I really don't need to search over the cameras. So what should happen is that the query should be routed to the left part of this tree. And how will it be routed to the left part of the tree? Well, through machine learning training. So the input will be in the form of a vector the routing will be through, let's say a classifier. And the classifier will again be a weight vector, which is in the same dimension as the input and that will route it appropriately. But now we need to learn the, that routing kind of function or classification from data. And so there's this machine learning training that happens 
where at every layer t, you end up, you want to try and find these coefficient vectors, right? So here, k sub l is the number of nodes at level l, and you want to find out these k sub l uh, coefficient vectors. And we use the same kind of thing that we talked about before, which is, uh, um, wait, did you say that there were 10 minutes left or? Okay, okay, sorry, thanks. So uh, uh, maybe I should speed up a little bit. Uh, um, so here you can use things like in the first slide I talked about, right? So there's a regularization and then there's a data fitting term. And what's very important is that when the XIs are very sparse, you can actually make these extremely sparse. So you can use an L1 penalty or you can use what's called the L0 penalty, which is essentially you sparsify by you know, truncating small entries down to zero without much loss in accuracy. So we do that heavily. And so um, at each level, the routing function is essentially this linear model. And we use you know, state-of-the-art libraries to solve uh, this binary classification problem. So, and like I said, in many cases, the, you know, the inputs are uh, very sparse, but you know, many of you might've heard this uh, uh, latest advance in sort of deep learning, uh, these uh, BERT models, which are bi-directional encoder uh, um, representations using transformers. What they do is they take the, the tokenization of the input they have a very uh, large deep neural network and they produce uh, a dense representation of the text or the input. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but uh, you know, transformers are you know, the, these deep learning models that uh, can handle sequence data very well. They utilize what's called the self-attention mechanism, uh, which essentially is actually just a whole bunch of uh, dense matrices. And these dense matrices now need to be learned. And you know, in typical uh, deep learning method, you use the methods of backpropagation and followed by uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent. So like I said, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but what we can do is basically in this tree, we can actually adapt to the, if the input is in this uh, 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 dense format. And uh, you know, in our method, in our PECO software, we have X linear or XR linear and XR transformer. The transformer is after these BERT models, and we can have both sparse and we can have dense vectorizations. And so the corresponding uh, coefficient vectors are partly sparse and partly dense. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about once the model has been learned, you basically end up having a tree right, which is this organization of the output space. And uh, you have coefficient vectors at uh, each level of the tree, right? Now, to find out the highest scoring uh, item in the output space, you really need to look at all the entire, the entire output space. But like I said, you know, there is, you can use heuristics. There is no need to try to go to the camera space when the inputs are uh, related to an iPad. So a technique to do that is uh, what's called beam search. So what you essentially end up doing is you um, have an input, it comes into the root. Suppose the beam size is two. You evaluate it for all the children, but you only look at the two largest values. And then you follow them down to the uh, leaf nodes. So here, this is one beam and this is another beam. And note that the decision to go here really depends on what happens up the tree, right? And the scoring function is again, like a multi-scale scoring function. This is, you know, this is composition along the path in this tree, right? And, uh, you know, this is typically a multiplication operation and sigma is like a squashing operation, like a sigmoid operation that's used in uh, deep learning. So that's how you look at the relevance of an input X to a leaf node, uh, in this case, J. Here is kind of the pseudocode for this. And uh, um, what you can show is, again, the reason I call it super fast inference is because the, by design, the, uh, by doing this beam search, uh, you know, beam size is little b, d is the dimensionality, 
the complexity of doing the inference is logarithmic in the size of the output space, right? So that's the big uh, way we can do fast inference. But there is still a lot hidden in this bigger notation, and this is given over here, right? So in this big O notation, it ends up being, you know, sparse matrix times sparse matrix at each level. And you have to know which part of the sparse matrix is being applied by in a data dependent manner, right? So um, again, I can't go, I won't go into too much detail, but what ends up happening is that, by the way, this matrix X is, you know, a bunch, a batch of inputs which are now uh, being uh, uh, inferred upon together, okay? So what you need to do is this, this operation ends up taking like more than 95% of the uh, training time. And if you don't optimize it, we don't get something that can be real time, okay? So this ends up being the mass matrix. This ends up being a highly sparse matrix X being, and this WL is also very sparse that I talked about. So here is like, a, a, so what we found is that if we just use a normal sparse matrix, prime sparse matrix data structure, you know, the, the latency is actually not uh, good enough. So what we did was we designed a special data structure and a special way of processing things, which is what we call as masked sparse chunk multiplication. So here I've kind of illustrated the idea. So now suppose I have five inputs, that come in, right? So these are this forms the matrix uh, capital X. Because I'm doing beam search, this says that you know the beam search is such that this is relevant, the first branch is relevant, and the third child is relevant. I don't need to do any operations over here for X1. So I need to basically compute, and then to be able to decide how to do the beam search later, I need to compute all these with all this four uh, 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 children, right? So here I've taken the example, it's a simple example, but I, here I've taken the example that the, there's four way partitioning, right? So um, it turns out that, you know, you can think about, this is, remember these are highly sparse. So if X is highly sparse, like one way of doing it is to have a, a CSC format, compressed sparse column format for the coefficients by which we can traverse this row this column, you know, using the appropriate sparse matrix data structures and compute this value, right? <clears throat> but it turns out that, you know, there is more additional structure to this problem. These coefficient vectors are for nearby products or nearby outputs. So they actually end up sharing quite a lot of the non-zeros. So the data structure that we come up is, you know, we basically end up storing this K0, K1, K2, K3 as chunk matrices and each of these rows. So the rest of the yellow part of the yellow part over here is uh, zeros and uh, these are sparse rows, okay? And so this is how we can basically get maximum uh, cache uh, efficiency. And what it does is it takes our baseline method and it reduces the latency by a factor of uh, 10 to 15. And that can basically be the difference between being able to do something in real time and not being able to. So let me now present some uh, experimental results uh, and then I will uh, conclude. So the Wikipedia example, you know, half a million examples, the transformer methods give us actually the best results. So here I have, listed some metrics that are used, uh, accuracy metrics that are used in machine learning and information retrieval called precision and recall. And as you can see that the X transformer results, the deep learning method is, uh, is the best in that sense. The hierarchical linear is uh, worse. And then there is something called fast text. You can't actually do have a softmax for all these 500,000 or half a million uh, output, so you, you can't do a softmax. So there is something called the hierarchical softmax, but that doesn't really perform that well. Uh, but this extra performance does come at a cost and the cost is training time. So for this uh, data set, if you use you know, a, pretty, uh, a pretty powerful GPU, you still need two weeks of training time 
Whereas for the hierarchical linear model, it only is about five to six hours, right? So um, an inference time we can reduce to about 20 uh, milliseconds. So let me now uh, talk a little bit about this application to uh, semantic search, right? And uh, so here is, uh, uh, you know, we did extensive experiments. Uh, so this is searching over 100 million products uh, from the Amazon catalog and um, extensive experiments with how to choose the, the dimensionality and the sparsity. So it ends out that the best performing model can be trained in one hour to two hours. And uh, this also has uh, low latency. So how does it work? Well, this was the example that I've given before. Uh, you know, we want the latency to be around, you know, very small, but we have 100 million products over here. So what happens is we arrange the 100 million items in this hierarchical tree. Then let's say a new query comes in, which is, you know, tiny iPad. Now, uh, uh, you know, the conventional way of asking that would be a mini iPad. So this is semantic search because it's, you know, you should be able to figure out that tiny is somewhat synonymous with, uh, with uh, mini and uh, the semantic indexing and so on helps in this. So uh, I know I'm kind of running out of time. I'll just take a minute. So what ends up happening in, in real time is your tiny iPad query comes in it gets routed through the street doing beam search, lots of sparse matrix times sparse matrix operations. Uh, and then finally, a list of results is returned to the customer. And when you actually uh, try this out, we see that uh, we've been able to get the latency down to 1.74 milliseconds, right? Over hundred million items. And this is what's called P99, which means if you have a huge batch, which is representative of a uh, uh, real uh, scenario, then 99% uh, of them have latency, which is less than equal to 1.74 milliseconds. So all this, like I said, is now in uh, open source. So give it a spin. We'll be more than happy if it helps people in their uh, research, but also would love to have contributions back from the open source community. So in conclusion, you know, I talked about very large scale outputs and uh, how linear algebra can help in each stage of doing this, you know, multi-scale organization of it through this uh, uh, hierarchical clustering, then getting sparsity in the training part. And then finally, to actually be able to get something which is uh, um, real time uh, using or developing some appropriate sparse matrix, time sparse matrix, uh, uh, subroutines. So, you know, I would love to, I, I would like to finally thank my uh, collaborators uh, who've, uh, you know, really done most of the work. Uh, I'm the messenger and uh, I've talked about several things uh, in this paper. So here is uh, a bunch of citations uh, for, or some of the citations for uh, the material that I've talked about. Okay, that's the end of my talk and I uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Interjit. Very interesting talk here. And lots of work here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lots of work by lots of people, actually. We have a couple of questions. Um, first one is from Ilse Ibsen. Uh, do you need the same accuracy for all outputs? For product search, you would want high accuracy for recommendations on the first screen, but for the remaining screens, things don't have to be so accurate anymore. Exactly. I mean, so, you know, you want to try and return, you know, the first few products to be the first few search results to be kind of more relevant. And so that's why the ranking part is actually very important. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's also this uh, thing in uh, when you have training data, you want to have try and avoid observational bias, right? So there's also a notion of uh, uh, exploration that is needed, right? Sometimes you want to try and surface results that haven't been uh, seen that much. So we actually have a follow-up work on how you can use this hierarchical uh, organization to actually do exploration also. I don't know if I answered Ilsa's question, but uh, but yeah, there and there is definitely a lot of position bias, right? A lot of people end up traveling, you know, end up uh, 
clicking on the first couple of results, then the then, then lower down. Another question is, um, I'm not an expert in ML, but I was just curious if a multiple output was used when OpenAI trained this blue and pink agents to play hide and seek game. Oh, I see. You know, I don't know if I know about, I mean, I know about OpenAI's GPT-2 and GPT-3, right? Those are basically language models and uh, they are working with large output spaces, but what they typically do is produce one token at a time. So when you are having like a chat pod or so, they will produce one token at a time and that's proportional to the size of the vocabulary, right? So it's not as big as what we are talking about. I actually don't know about these uh, blue and pink agents to play hide and seek. Uh, here's an interesting question by uh, Hiroshi Murakami. Uh, is this a model of human memory in the brain? Uh, you know, I, I, I would say we have not done anything to try and model human memory and I would not try and make a claim like that. Um, I think even the people who do deep learning, even though they make analogies with neurons and synapses, they kind of have this disclaimer that uh, this is not necessarily modeling uh, the human memory in the brain. So I would not go uh, as far. I mean, it's really, it's really good old machine learning, statistics, and linear algebra. Um, one question from um, Parikshi to Badiaya. Have you tried, what is your opinion on other nonlinear clustering methods like yeah. the pillar clustering? Yeah, I mean, we can try using other methods. I mean, uh, um, I don't see any, well, the question is, can we do these at the scale, right? So that's the, the, you know, remember that, for example, in this uh, 100 million uh, output space example, right? My, mate, my graph, bipartite graph has uh, 100 million nodes on one side. Right, and uh, you know, a huge number of nodes on the other side. I forget how many input training data was there. So um, there is work that we try and do, which is because there's a little bit of a mismatch, right? This hierarchical organization is done without, uh, um, how should I say it? Without total recourse to the training data. And you know, ideally what we would do is we would be reorganizing this hierarchical Three, as we see more and more data coming in. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we can possibly benefit from better clustering methods. I don't see, um, I don't see that huge a benefit. One thing, by the way, I did not mention is that typically when you use these methods, you actually use, you can use multiple such multi-scale organizations. So what can what what we can do is we have one hierarchical tree and that produces a prediction. Then we have another hierarchical tree that produces another prediction because you know clustering is a very uh, uh, you know the, the, uh, clustering is tricky, right? But that second hierarchical tree will then produce its own prediction and then we and so you can have multiple of these organizations and then you can use an ensemble method to get the final prediction. So to me, I think there's more value in that than trying to you know, get a perfect clustering method. One more question. Uh, this is from Hans de Sterk. Uh, is there a personalization in the product search? Do you have um, also a, a hierarchy of users? No, you know, typically when we do product search, we are only responding to the uh, query that is uh, typed by the, by the user. You know, this is, remember, this is a real time. Uh, um, in real time, we are trying to respond to the query. This is not like the personalization that you see when you, for example, go into your homepage or so. I don't see any other questions on the Q&A. Uh, so since uh, we are a little bit past our time, um, ah, one more came in, I'll do the, Honor for one more question. Yeah. Dan Bolley asks, is it easy to update the tree or must it be redone from scratch? Awesome question. So, you know, typically right now we are just redoing it uh, from scratch, but we actually have an intern project this summer. The intern just uh, showed up this week. Uh, 
where we can basically try these incremental learning uh, uh, procedures, right? So it's not just the, the tree, but even the actually the classifiers at each node. And then of course, the problem with kind of, you know, changing the tree even slightly is, you know, you may have to relearn all the classifiers uh, again. So great question that, you know, is something which uh, uh, makes a big difference in practice. Uh, but, you know, at least our methods are not the ones which require like training for like, you know, two months. <laughs> there are these deep learning methods that need training for two months. We, here we can actually do uh, training in, uh, in a daily fashion, even if we do it from scratch. But yes, Dan's question is great. And I think that's something that we need to get more efficient about. Well, we'd like to thank you again, Inderjit. Very stimulating okay. talk, concluding this very stimulating week of- Okay, well, thank you for having me. So this brings us to the end of the conference. I'm going to share my own screen here with the So everyone sees the concluding concluding remarks closing remarks up there Okay So here we are at the 23rd conference of the International Linear Algebra Society and the ILAS 2021 um of course, we have to start with the thank yous that we started this conference. Um, uh, first, I want to thank the uh, program committee, the organizing committee of this conference uh, for bearing with us and all the pestering questions we had for about two years, sending them drudgery to do all the time and responding back to us. Um, the others committee was uh, very helpful. Uh, they basically gathered everything, all the information they needed for the ILAS. We didn't have to do all the ILAS submissions. They did everything. So a big thank you to the ILAS community. Uh, and of course, the invaluable help from the Cyan, Cyan conference staff. Uh, we have a bunch of names up there. Uh, Richard, Eva, Wendy, uh, Connie, and Kirsten all helped tremendously, and Kimberly all helped tremendously here. Uh, and of course, a thank you to the uh, uh, to the U.S. National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research uh, for their continuous support of this conference. Uh, I'm going to pass on now my uh, microphone to Misha, who's going to give you some more results, number results. Thank you again. Thank you. So uh, thank you to all the participants. Um, the most recent figures that we have are that we had participation from 38 different countries on five continents. So thank you to everyone. Uh, final uh, attendance figures, top 600. Uh, we ended up with a total of 10 plenary talks, two of which were ILAS. Uh, we, there were four um, award talks, two of which were ILAS. And quite a few mini symposia talks, contributed talks, uh, posters, too many tutorials this time around, and a total of uh, 44 student and early career travel awards were made. And finally, uh, in talking with the, the leadership for the SIAM activity group on linear algebra, they asked us to mention uh, to keep in mind that there is a call for proposals for the location for LA24. Um, if you are in attendance and you have not yet done so, please consider joining the, the activity group on linear algebra. And uh, for all of us who are uh, members should remember to participate in the elections. And while I'm mem uh, mentioning membership, please think about joining ILAS. We do want to hear from you. So if you haven't already, you should be soon receiving uh, SIAM LA21 survey. So please fill that out. That helps prepare uh, for the will help the, the next crew to prepare for the next meeting. Um, and a reminder that if you missed something this week, uh, please feel free to come back. You have three months to come back and uh, review talks. Um, and thank you all again very much.